everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Bridge from the Past. This is Mary Patterson, and this week I'm coming to you from my parents' basement. I'm not making this up because just out of view here is a picture of me when I was in middle school. All I can say, if you're in middle school and watching this now, is that it gets better, so hang in there. But that's not actually what we're talking about today. This week, I'm joined once again by my colleague, Josh Schmidt, to look at a political cartoon from the presidential election of 1824. Hi, Josh. Hey, Mary. Josh is with us to help think about continuity and change in presidential elections. In modern times, elections are pretty interesting and newsworthy events. But was this the case nearly 200 years ago? Let's dive in and see. Okay, so here is our image. The title is A Foot Race and it is from 1824. As always, whenever we're confronted with a historic visual, we really just want to take a minute and look make some observations, and try to turn those observations into questions. Right off the bat, I'm noticing that there are a lot of people in this image. It's very crowded, it's very busy. There's a lot of speech bubbles that are a little difficult to make out. So one of my questions might be, who are these people and what are they saying or how much of what they're saying do I need to know? Josh, what strikes you about this image? Yeah, so the first thing that really seems to stand out in the foreground is it seems like it's a racetrack um, with uh, three men on the left are running and it seems like everyone in the crowd is talking about the race and focusing on it in some way or another. Yeah, and I think the title gives a good clue for that too. This, this is a race as he's titled it and you can make out the three guys in the front and everybody else is you know, really excited about what's going on, what's the outcome gonna be. So just some more basic information about this image is that, again, this is from 1824, and that was a presidential election year. At the very top in the center of the image is the presidential chair. And it's kind of difficult to make out, but we're assuming they're racing for this chair. And the artist was named David Claypool Johnson. And in addition to being a cartoonist, he was also an um, artist and an actor. So very much involved in the creative side of things. So there's a little bit more information, but I still don't really have enough context to figure out what's going on here. So Josh, help us out. Like give us, you know, situate this image in the time period from which it comes. Yeah, so you initially mentioned uh, how much of this is a continuity um, to our modern day. And I would say it certainly is. The election of 1824 was just as crazy as any modern election could be. So first off, just for a little background, um, after the War of 1812, the Federalist Party was severely weakened, leading to increased national unity. So in the election of 20, 1824, there were four candidates who ran, but they all had generally similar ideologies. They all would consider themselves to be uh, Jeffersonian Republicans as far as their ideas went. These four men were John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, William Harris Crawford, and Henry Clay. So despite the general national unity though, sectional differences still existed within the party, which become apparent when you look at the breakdown of voting in the election. Uh, Andrew Jackson, who um, we all have heard of, of course, received the most elector votes in this election. And he generally drew his support from the South and the West because he was from Tennessee. John Quincy Adams received the second largest amount of elector votes, and he drew his support as a man from Massachusetts from New England. William, uh, William Crawford, or William Harris Crawford, drew uh, the third largest amount of elector votes, and that was generally from the South and the Mid Atlantic. And Henry Clay, poor Henry Clay, came in fourth place, and uh, he won his home state of Kentucky, and then like two other 
uh, Northwestern states. Um, what became very interesting about this election, though, is that no candidate received a majority of the elector votes. And according to the 12th Amendment of the Constitution, if no one candidate has a majority of elector votes, the House of Representatives votes to select the president from the top three candidates. So under this system, Henry Clay, because he was in fourth place, was eliminated. However, he was the Speaker of the House at the time. So he was going to have immense power in the selection of who would be the next president. So ultimately, uh, John Quincy Adams is selected to be president. And Adams then proceeds to select Henry Clay to be his secretary of state, which at the time was a very coveted position because it was generally seen to be a stepping stone to the presidency. Jackson, of course, is uh, incensed at this because he won the popular vote and, he, or I'm sorry, he received the largest number of popular votes and the largest number of elector votes. Um, and of course he doesn't win the presidency. Then on top of that, he sees what happens between Clay and Adams to be a corrupt bargain. Um, he argues that Clay and Adams basically uh, work together behind closed doors um, in a, uh, I will give you the presidency if you give me the secretary of state position. Mm, very interesting. So wheeling and dealing in 1824. So let me make sure that I'm recapping this. So in 1824, this is, we're electing only the sixth president for the United States. So we're still a relatively young country, but we're out of the founding period. We are coming out of this so-called era of good feelings where you said all four of these candidates in this election came from the same I guess party is what we would call it but they probably wouldn't have called it that but they're all sort of running against each other which is immediately kind of interesting especially if you think about modern elections and how we have this two-party system and there's no winner in the electoral college Jackson and general now senator Andrew Jackson gets the popular vote so that's also pretty interesting because that's something that has come up in other elections. So as you said, the House of Representatives gets to decide this and Henry Clay is this wonderful term of king maker and this corrupt bargain of you give me the secretary of state and I'll make you president. So the out, John Quincy Adams becomes president, Henry Clay gets his coveted secretary of state and Andrew Jackson is pretty upset um, and he's just going to start planning to try again, and he will ultimately do that and come back and win in 1828. So all of this information is starting to help me figure out what's going on in this image. So again, there's that presidential chair up at the top, and that's what they're racing for. And then here are candidates. So from left to right, I guess it's Adams, William Crawford, Andrew Jackson in the military uniform, and then Henry Clay, who's sort of dropped out, exhausted. And he comes in fourth with the electoral votes, as you said. So it kind of makes sense the way that um, he's positioned them in this race. And then the people in the crowd are very interesting too. So what what's going on with this guy? Yeah, so he, on the left there, uh, one man is shouting, hurrah for our Jackson. So obviously he's uh, cheering for Andrew Jackson. Um, then though that man who is circled is shouting hurrah for our son Jack. Um, so obviously a bit of a play on words there. And this man is actually John Adams, the father of John Quincy Adams, um, former president obviously. And so he's uh, cheering his son on and hoping that he will win this foot race. So that's also interesting is that you have a father son who both occupy the presidency pretty early on in our in American history. And then there's this interesting scene in the middle. I'm wondering what's going on here. Yeah, this one is actually one of the, the more amusing interactions of the the drawing, you have a rather politically incorrect um, 
depiction here of an Irish man. Mm -hmm. um, and I say politically incorrect because the Irish man, of course, is talking about alcohol. Um, and so he says, blast my eyes if I don't venture a small horn of rot gut and the, on that bald filly in the middle, which um, translates basically to, I'm going to wager a bit of alcohol on the man in the middle, which, um, which uh, I believe is John Quincy Adams in, in that picture. And another man replies, uh, damn my wig if I don't bet you. And that's that bald man. So um, he apparently doesn't have a wig. Uh -huh. Perhaps he lost it in a different bet. Uh, we're not really sure. But, but the interesting thing about that interaction is the fact that they're betting on it like they would bet on a horse race. And I think that this kind of depicts the politics of the time. There's increased democratization, um, and with that, the the stereotype is, of course, that politics becomes dirtier. Mm -hmm. And so, initially, you have George Washington, our first president, who who says, "I don't want to be president," and you know he doesn't even campaign, doesn't get down into the dirt um, in that sense. And now, of course, you have this election being depicted as a race. Um, they're basically animals who are competing for this. And of course, with that, you get these uh, people who are going to be betting alcohol on who wins the race. So it's an interesting showing of what politics at the time looked like. It is very interesting. Well, first of all, I love the phrase rot gut. I think that alcohol should always be referred to as rot gut. That's fantastic. But also, it, again, just this, the huge change from Washington who wouldn't campaign. But then even I think in the second election, you have a little bit more of, well, because Washington was sort of so unique in his role in creating the country. He was a shoe in basically. He's unanimously elected. But from here on out, there's just more sort of as you said, it's like getting dirtier and how do you, how do you win this office? I mean, it's a big, it's sort of seen as this prize. There's this money bag hanging next to the presidential chair. So it's pretty, um, pretty interesting. Um, and then I think there's one more. Oh, and then of course we have Henry Clay over here and it looks like someone is consoling him, which makes sense given that he ultimately gets in the position as Speaker of the House to pretty much decide the election. Yeah, so you see Clay there, he's obviously very fatigued. Um, and so he's had to stop running the race. And however, there is the man next to him who says, don't distress yourself. There will be scrubbing by and by, and then you'll have a chance. Um, so basically, like, don't worry, uh, you're still going to have a lot of power in deciding this, which of course he does as Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. This is, I think this is really, really fascinating. So I think I don't, the perception is that politics um, can be very dirty, it can be very nasty, but has it always been that way? Or is it more so today than back then? I mean, I think these are really interesting questions. Is this cartoon um, is it a, does it illustrate a change in how we think of presidential elections, or does it illustrate a continuity? Many historians say that this election, the 1824 presidential election, is one of the most contentious and controversial in U.S. history. So, I don't know. What do you guys think? You should let us know. Is this a continuity? Is this a change? What are your thoughts? We'll leave you with these questions to ponder. Josh, thank you so much for helping us decode a foot race from 1824. We hope that you learned something. If you did, be sure to like the video and check out our other offerings on our YouTube channel. And until then, stay curious. We'll see you later.